CCDC brings you Disability Power in Colorado since 1975 with Kristen Castor. Um, I was asked to do this webinar because I remember what it was like when the only choice was nursing homes. And I participated in the movement from a nursing home to the community. So I'm one of the few people who has that direct experience still. And that's kind of what I want to bring to you, how we got being stuck in a nursing home, and you can see what's happening to nursing homes now, to, you know, becoming, at least in Denver, one of the most powerful disability rights communities in the nation, in the world. So that's all stuff I'm going to try to cover. It all starts really when I was 13, let's see, that would have been something like 67 or 68, I think 67. I was 13, I was being bused to a junior high that was outside my school district. It was, um, and I was riding a paratransit bus because I was paraplegic with cerebral palsy and a school that was in my district had stairs and they did not want me in their school because I was a liability. I might fall and hurt myself, my parents might sue. And I'm looking at them and I'm saying, I'm perfectly capable of taking care of myself, thank you. And what that taught me was that if I was not able to do absolutely everything by myself without any assistance, I wasn't going to get anywhere. So here I am riding this paratransit bus to a different junior high outside of my neighborhood because it was flat. And on this paratransit bus are all the other kids that are being bused from around Jefferson County, from Golden to Wheat Ridge. <laughs> you know, they're being bused to the same school, or they're being picked up and taken to Fletcher Miller. Fletcher Miller was a special school where those kids were bused. And I took a look at the situation and I said, you know, none of us wants to be on this stupid bus, so we might as well enjoy ourselves and make the most out of it. And that's where I met a fellow called named Mike Smith. He had muscular dystrophy and he had just reached the point where he had to use a wheelchair. We spent hours on that bus depending on the year, sometimes two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening because we were going all around Jefferson County. And we were teenagers, and so we shared all of our teenage stuff, and this was our peer group. And it was really strange because I'd go to school and I'd be in normal classes and I'd have one peer group there, then I'd get on the bus and have a completely different peer group over there. But whatever it was, I knew that I didn't have control of my life. All I had control over was what I did with the situations I was given. Now, when I reached eighth grade, uh, Mike was taken aside and he was told, you know, we think we've got a school that you will do better in and we are going to trial you there for three weeks and if you don't like it, then you can come back. They lied. The school was Fletcher Miller. The reason they were transferring him was because he was beginning to need help in the bathroom and the school did not want to expose his friends to that. So they moved him to Fletcher Miller. Now, bear in mind, muscular dystrophy, he had Duchenne. Duchenne's is fatal. Not all muscular dystrophy is, but his was. And he was probably not going to live past 21. Now, I already knew this, but I didn't say anything. I thought, you know, that's what that Jerry Lewis guy is doing all of his telethons on. I think it's fatal, but if he doesn't know that, I don't think it's my job to tell him. <laughs> so I just went along and we were friends. Uh, he was not allowed to come back to junior high. 
he went through high school at Fletcher Miller along with those kids. And I went to regular high school and we rode the bus together. Now, it's really nasty. I'll, I'll show you. That's, this is what I was testing out before I got on Zoom. Just to see if you could see this. You can see a little bit of it. It's a portrait that was drawn of Mike when he was about 16. He was at Fletcher Miller. This was done by his art teacher, Louise Cadillac, who's a well-known artist in the Denver area. That's him at 16, trying to grow his hair out and be 16. And uh, stuck at Fletcher Miller. He did not know that Duchenne was fatal. His doctors told his mother it would be hard for him so not to tell him. So at Fletcher Miller, a third of the class has muscular dystrophy and they're all in different stages. So they told him what was going to happen. He wouldn't talk to his mother for three weeks. So that's the life we led. And then when we graduated from high school, then the real problem came because I was able to go on to college. And I knew at that point that if I was ever going to be independent, actually have a job and maybe live in my own apartment, I had to have a college degree because I can't type. My, my fingers are slow and my timing isn't very good. It hasn't improved in the 40 years since then, you know? <laughs> so I learned about as well as I can get with my coordination. I, I knew I wouldn't be able to stand being a secretary. I couldn't flip burgers. What else could I do? I had to be able to do something. So I went to college and Mike went to a nursing home. Actually, he'd been in a nursing home since he was 15. And the reason was, he was too heavy for his mother to lift. Okay, going to a nursing home, you're 15 years old, you can't choose when you get up, you can't choose what you put on, you can't choose when you eat, what you eat, what you do during the day, when you go to bed, anything. Those decisions are all made by someone else because that's when it's convenient for the people to do it. And so you're basically a head of lettuce being carried around, dressed up and bathed and throw a little food at you and that's it. Plus you shared the room with uh, two other people. So no privacy. And if you tried to close the door, they opened the door and said he was being antisocial. So it's the epitome of not having any control of your life. And here I am going out to college and learning how to ride the bus and learning how to do things that people without disabilities learn how to do. And it was nasty. Well, I came home one summer and Mike was in a different nursing home run by the same family, same building, format, but it was a different nursing home. And they had put all these young people together. Some of them had been raised in an institution, but they weren't retarded. They just had physical disabilities. Some of them were extremely developmentally disabled. Some of them had been in car accidents. Some like Mike were born with some kind of wasting disease, all sorts of people, but they were all young people with disabilities. And that's where I met Wade Blank. Now, I have back up again, so you can see. You can't see it. Ah, shucks. Anyway, I'm still wearing my Wade Blank t-shirt because without him, there would be no disability rights movement in Colorado. Wade Blank was a Presbyterian minister who marched with Martin Luther King and went to the same Chicago school that many social change advocates went to and studied with Sala Linsky. And um, he was at Kent State when four students were shot during the anti-war protests 
and he left there and was very disheartened and felt that civil disobedience was dangerous. And he got a job in this nursing home and he looked at all these kids and he says, how could I make your life easier? And they said, get us out of here. And he said, well, no, I can't do that. So he tried to make their lives better within the nursing home by giving them 24 hour visiting privileges, telephones in their rooms, the right to decorate their rooms, to bring in radios and televisions, and to order pizza and things like that for dinner. He took them out to movies. He took them out to concerts. I remember going to Red Rocks and they didn't have things figured out yet. They just knew that the handicapped seating was on stage and the road that went up to that way did not pass the ticket booth. So we got in for free and saw Carol King. Oh, that was great. So people, people went to concerts, people went to movies, people had movies brought in, and he kept trying to get him to think, now, what do you need to do to make your life better? And they were just enjoying their lives until one of them decided to take a little booze along with her barbiturates and she didn't wake up in the morning. She didn't want her school friends to know that she lived in a nursing home. And she knew darn well what she was doing. So her parents told the nursing home they would not sue if Wade was fired. So they fired him. They revoked all of the privileges. And Wade went to Mexico to sulk for a while. Meanwhile, Mike Smith, let's see, where was I? I was in Europe. Okay. Mike Smith decided he was beginning to get bronchitis. And he asked the nurse to please let him see a doctor. And she refused. It developed into pneumonia. He ended up in St. Anthony's Hospital, practically dying. And that's where he could see Wade again. And he said, I'm going to do something. Um, they hurt you and I'm gonna do something. And Wade said, please don't. These people will make your life miserable. I know them. Don't do this. You're too weak. And Mike said, I don't care. I don't wanna die in a nursing home and I don't have very long to live. So what he did was he called legal services and he said his rights were being violated. The only charge they could make stick was they had signed his name on his welfare check because they assumed that he was going to die. Well, he didn't die. And so then management was trying to break up the whole community there and the kids started protesting. So legal services uh, put out an order that they were not to move any of these kids until they came up with something. And then Wade, came back from Mexico and thought, I have to do something. I have to help the kids. So he went to um, the housing authority over on 11th and Federal. There used to be a housing complex. It's not there anymore. It was called Las Casitas. And there were all these little cinder block caves, is what my mother called them. They couldn't keep them they were like little little houses in a row or something. And um, so he says, he, he turns to the housing authority and he says, I want to try an experiment. Um, are you willing to work with me? And they said, okay. And so for, I think it was, there were eight apartments to begin with that they put ramps on and bars in the bathroom and things like that. And then he went to Medicaid. And he said, look, I know that you're only allowed to give services in a medical environment. Are you willing to consider these people's apartments as their medical environment? And they said, well, okay. And they kind of wink, wink, nod, nod, decided not to protest too much. As long as everything was under the care of um, registered nurse and everything. 
So I came back one summer, I think this was from graduate school, and or no, it was still, it was from Europe, yes. When I got back from Europe, he was in his own apartment in the Atlantis community. And they named it the Atlantis community because that symbolized hope and control. And you could feel the tension because like I said, most of these kids grew up in institutions. They did not grow up in the community. Some of them didn't even have families. And the older ones, if they had been in a car accident or something, their families had abandoned them. So these were people who had no one. And they were not expected to be able to do anything worthwhile with their lives. So you could see the tension because they were used to being served and fighting each other along a corridor. And now they had to learn to telephone the office for help. And they had to go to each other's apartments if they wanted to talk to each other. And that was really new. The other thing that was really new is they got their full SSI check. Instead of the $10 personal needs check that they got in the nursing home, and by the way, this meant that $10 was a lot of money to them because that's the only amount of money they ever saw. So they got their SSI check and Atlantis would make sure that they paid the rent and the utilities and then the rest was theirs. Well, there are a couple of things that happened first. They all got pets and the pets ran away within three weeks because they didn't know how to take care of animals. They also took a friend over to eat at the Wiener Schnitzel across the street. Now, Wiener Schnitzel hasn't been around for a long, long time, but it was a fast food restaurant with an A-frame roof like that. And there was one right across from um, the Atlantis community and they got the city to make the walk length uh, longer for them. It started out with two people to an apartment and there were 13 people to begin with. Mike's apartment was the office because at that time he was very fragile. He was bedridden. He could not sit up all the way. He was on oxygen and he needed more help. I was able to serve as his attendant only because it was Atlantis, because it was Wade, because he believed that we should have power over ourselves. And when it got to the point where his attendants were saying, well, he doesn't need that much oxygen, you couldn't possibly survive on what he's getting, it's so little. And I said, Wade, they're turning his oxygen off when he's asleep and he wakes up and it terrifies him. And Wade posted on his oxygen bottle, not to be changed without his express permission. That, you would not believe the difference that made in my life to know that something so small as that, he had the right to set his oxygen level, even if he physically could not do it. So it was just groundbreaking. And to have the right to choose who you had to do things for you. Um, I brought him his meals. I helped bathe him. I did as much as I possibly could until it was time to go back to school. And then of course I felt guilty because I could always leave and go on with my life and he couldn't. But I also couldn't not have a life and be stuck with him because then I'd be putting myself back. So it was a very difficult time in my life, um, but I knew that things were getting better. And from that community on um, 11th and Federal, everything that has anything to do with disability in the state of Colorado happened. The next year when I came back after Mike died, I worked in the office and made some money, and I could see the changes in people. It took them a year, but they figured it out. They figured it out. They were in power, and you could see it in the way they carried themselves, in the things they said. Um, they would have meetings, and then one woman who had been at Ridge, um, Wheat Ridge Residential 
when they found her. She said, okay, people, I am temporary, temporarily splitting the scene. And she got in her wheelchair and zoomed away to wherever it was she wanted to go. And it was just terrific. It was also very hard because none of the bureaucratic pathways had been set up to pay for the attendance and to keep track of all this stuff. So it was a, a wing and a prayer, not knowing how they were going to get paid from month to month for about a year. And they got all that figured out. And then along comes 1978. And Wade is thinking, okay, uh, they tried to get lifts on buses and they actually succeeded in getting a few because buses use federal money. And there's this law, Section 504 of the Rehab Act of 1973, that says if you get federal money, your programs need to be accessible. So they got some lifts and then President Reagan um, weakened that provision for buses and they actually welded the lift shut. So July 5th, 1978, Wade got a few people together and he says, okay, you guys, I want to try something, are you with me? And of course, Wade had gotten them out of the nursing home. So yeah, they were with him. Yeah, they owed him their lives. And I'm not kidding, it was that kind of devotion. So uh, they sent a fella up to the bus and he's paraplegic, no, he's quadriplegic cerebral palsy. And he, he goes up to the door and the bus driver says, what do you want? He says, I wanna get on. Bus driver looks at him and closes the door looks up there's a wheelchair in front of the bus looks behind him there's a wheelchair in back of the bus he can't go anywhere they had captured a bus that was the most empowering thing anybody had ever done they held the intersection from broadway and colfax for three days three days. Pat Schroeder, who was our congressperson at that time, was throwing them sandwiches. Um, and as one per participant said, you could tell that they were referring this to higher and higher ups by the color of braid on their uniforms. The police did not know what to do. And they asked Wade if they could help, and he says, yeah, arrest us. So eventually they did. They tried to pull people back in their wheelchairs, tipped a couple of people over, that got caught on camera. That was real good publicity for the police department. You can imagine that. And um, when they finally did break up the protest, then they didn't have any way to transport them to the jail and they had to commandeer vans from nursing homes to get them to the jail. And then they couldn't take them inside for booking because the jail was not accessible. So they had to book them and let them go home. And then when it came time for the court hearing, they couldn't get into the courtroom because the building was inaccessible. Guess who the judge was? Have you ever heard of Richard Bench, the uh, Oklahoma City bombing judge? that was the judge and he said seems to me these people deserve their day in court and since they can't get into court we are vacating the tickets it was perfect it was the perfect example of something that was not accessible now i see that i'm almost out of time so what i'm going to say is that everything else that developed in Colorado, including the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, came as a response to the Atlantis community in terms of residential options and adapt in terms of militant um, advocacy, civil disobedience. Um, there was another organization set up for a while called HAIL that eventually became PASCO. Let's see, uh, there was 
one of the 202 buildings that was set up. It was called the Halcyon House, and I think it still exists, and there are people still living there. There were some people in our group who really wanted to live within their own community, and they feel very strongly about that still at Halcyon House. But it is a little closed community. And if we had gone that way with the Atlantis community, it would have created a ghetto. We can go anywhere now and live anywhere we want to. And that includes Halcyon House. So it's, it's not a bad thing. It's just that now we have a full range of services. Now, the tie-in to today is that you see how people in nursing homes are dying because it's a congregate living situation. One person gets COVID-19 and kablooey the whole institution gets it. We are not in a congregate setting now. We're out in the community. We're surviving much better. Sometimes as people grow old, they're being able to make use of the same things that we built and designed, but they don't think of themselves as disabled. So they don't see that they can use these things, they can share them. It's because disability still has stigma to it. Just like being black has stigma, being a homosexual has stigma. All those things have stigma in our society. I don't know why, it's just something that we agreed that we don't like. And it doesn't matter what word we use, challenged, disabled, other abled, handicapped, crippled, whatever it is we use, is a word of empowerment to some people and a word of um, helplessness to other people. It'll only change when people's attitudes change. So whenever you look around and you see people with disabilities, whether they know about Atlantis or ADAPT or not, they are making use of the things we built and the sacrifices we made to get them there. And we're not done. We won't be finished until disability doesn't have a stigma. So, questions? Or have I bored you? You know you have a whole hour, right? Wade Blank died in 1993. It was a very tragic accident. He went again to Mexico with his family for a vacation. His son was pulled out on a riptide and he went out with him and they were both drowned. He had made it a key point to always, always, always be training other leaders because he didn't want to have himself uh, disappear and have the movement fall apart. And that leadership keeps coming up and keeps coming up. So, yeah, CCDC is, we also have our leadership training programs because we always need new leaders our issues are always changing we need yeah. new leaders so that people will keep going to the next stage yeah. to the next thing that we have to overcome um you know i can relate with that um and uh i was because uh, i myself and me and my sister are disabled and um so i've got different types of uh art uh, rheumatoid arthritis that run from my shoulders all the way through my body down to my feet so i've got arms legs hips feet just full of uh different types of uh arthritis and sickle cell anemia and fibromyalgia and other stuff you know yeah you just add them and i was taking you get you out of them right <laughs> yeah 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 you know and i was taking a bus one time trying to catch a bus to a doctor's appointment and i dearly needed to make that doctor's appointment and the bus driver, this was in Omaha, Nebraska. That's where, you know, I was born and from. And um, there are uh, states a lot different from where we're at. But uh, the uh, anyway, the uh, bus driver, he uh, 
said to me, I said, well, can you roll down the stairs, you know, so that I could go up with the walker? And he was like, you going to make me late. I'm running late, and you're going to have to catch the next bus. So I had to walk five blocks down in order to, uh, you know, get this other bus, you know, where I could be on time. And, and I thought to myself, how rude. I mean, he don't know if I was going to the emergency or what, you know. And I think it's just awful in these times and days where you can go to the moon, but you can't uh, make certain things, you know, for disabled people. It seems like a lot of times when you, um, like parking spots in place, certain places and in certain states, uh, you would think that they would be more closer to the building. In uh, Alabama, the people who weren't disabled got to park right where the door was. And the people who were disabled, they were like two, three row, car rolls back. That's where the disabled spot was put. And sometimes when people who don't have any disabilities, uh, they don't really think or can't think about what disabilities a disabled person needs because they're not disabled. And sometimes I feel like we need disabled people who are disabled to, like they can um, comment more on what the needs need to be like in like apartment complexes and just all over everywhere, uh, thinking more about a disabled person. And to me, sometimes you need a disabled person to tell you what you need because they know. Like, I know what I need, you know, versus somebody who's not disabled thinking, well, okay, you're disabled. I'm going to put these cars, uh, like where I am right now, I'm going to put these cars uh, where, where the car is parked right next to the house. But we're going to put the disabled spot way away from the house. And then when you come to your stairs, you have to go upstairs with walkers. It, like if I had a uh, electric wheelchair, it would not be able to be here because it can't go up the stairs unless somebody makes a wheelchair that can do that. You know what that's called? Upstairs. There is a name for that. It's mm -hmm. called ableism. And it is a form of discrimination. Mm -hmm. And it is illegal. Yeah. It is illegal. Yeah, that's what I'm about. According to the Americans with Disabilities Act, you have equal rights to transportation. Now, let me explain a little bit about what that means. Let's say you've got two tie down spots in the bus right. and you have another person in a wheelchair that wants to get on. That's three wheelchairs. Technically, the bus driver can say, I'm full now. You'll have to wait for the next one. That also mm -hmm. happens if you have a crowd of people at the bus stop and the bus driver mm -hmm. says, I'm full now, you'll have to wait for the next one. Oh, in, yeah. In Denver, there was no, nobody. Like, I know. I know. I know what you're saying. And in Denver, people don't insist on being tied down. And sometimes people will ride in the aisle. Um, that's not allowed here in Pueblo because of safety concerns. And I can tell you, by the condition of our roads, they're probably right. But, yeah. Um, that is a right. So is equal access to housing. Housing is harder to fight because it is yes. a private public kind of thing, but you do have that right. And you can learn how to enforce both of those things by taking our advocacy program at CCDC. We will mm. teach you, you know, what your rights mm. are, where to find them, and how to get them enforced. Now, RTD is back and oh, forth. Man. Sometimes, you know, if, if we catch them doing that, CCDC gives them help, but it's constant. We keep having to monitor that and monitor that and monitor that because there are always times when the bus driver doesn't want to stop to let the wheelchair on. So we have to let them know yeah. that we are looking and we will hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. you know? And you can be one of those people. 
Well, I will be one of those people. <laughs> just, just by taking the advocacy course. And I see okay. we've got um, Richard Hodge. Oh, um, yeah. The workshop program during the inception of Heritage House. Yes. Heritage House is the name of the second nursing home. They've changed the name because they don't want to be associated with the history. It is actually on First and Sheridan. <laughs> I'll tell you that. And um, when Mike graduated from high school, uh, Wade tried to convince Larrod and Hall that there were people with disabilities who could do more than stuff fish hooks in boxes because that's the way they would do it it was a sheltered workshop and that means they come up with assembly line kinds of tasks they will have an able-bodied person perform that task for 15 minutes multiply that by four that is your going rate that's what you use to measure everybody else against and then you have people with disabilities, and usually it's cognitive disabilities, but it can also be physical disabilities. And they pay you according to how well you meet up to that standard. Well, if they could meet that standard, they wouldn't be at the workshop. So they're, they're working at sub minimum wage, and it's allowed. That is one of the last bastions to, to fall. That you, there is, I think it's still on the books in Colorado that you can pay people with disabilities according to what they can do compared to a person without a disability. And we are getting that off. You know, I am, we have a sheltered workshop down here in Pueblo. And the guy has said, okay, if this is good enough for people with disabilities, it's good enough for anybody. You know, so he takes on people who are not disabled, and he also thinks of different things to do for people with disabilities so that they're doing a real job and not just stuffing fish hooks in boxes. Anyway, um, they brought Mike to the shelter workshop and they said, well, you know, we think he can work in the office. And um, they're used to working with people with, and I'll use the word because I don't know, now we call it um, IDD, but they called it mental retardation at that time. And, um, and they're very um, patronizing about it. I mean, I knew a lot of people and I'm going, look, it doesn't matter what disability you've got. I don't care if you're purple. What people want are to be treated with respect, to be respected like anybody else, regardless of what your disability is. You know you're different. That's, you know, anybody with any kind of a disability, you know you're different. But that doesn't mean people have to treat you like a puppy, you know? So anyway, they brought Mike in and they gave him a stack of addition problems. And he was done in about 10 minutes and they came back in an hour and they looked at that and he said, oh, my goodness, you, you finished those. And he says, yeah. So the next day it was subtraction problems and more amazement. And the next day it was multiplication problems. And the last day Mike said, I've had enough of this. I'm not gonna work here. You don't wanna work with me. And that's been my experience growing up to a certain point. If something's wrong with your leg, they think your brain is on, you know, somehow you know it's true that the hip bone is connected to the ankle bone but it's not quite that just because you can't talk or just because you can't walk it doesn't mean that you don't have a brain or the same desires that anyone else has so that was that was my experience or the story that i know about the sheltered workshop program now i think Larridan hall still exists and I think they have to do very different things to prepare people for real jobs that have meaning. Um, and it's like you ought to be able to find something that somebody can do.
and be paid for. You know, that's one of the things we have to fight for. The other thing we have to fight for, part-time work is okay. What you want is for us to be less dependent on benefits. If you work part-time, you're still paying taxes. And if that's all you can do, you are already not needing maybe food stamps or maybe a housing subsidy. That certainly is better than sitting at home knitting potholders, you know? So that's the other thing we've got to do. And you can tell that I wouldn't sit at home and knit potholders if that's what they made me do. I'd do something. <laughs> Climb out the window and go find something else to do. Anything else? I have a question. Uh, yeah. Hi, so um, my name is Anna and I'm currently working as a um, community organizer for Center for People with Disabilities ah, in yes. uh, Boulder. Yes, well, yes. our offices are, are all over, but um, I, I wanted to know just, you know, first of all, it was amazing listening to your story of everything and especially you being there firsthand through all this. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely still learning about the movement in a lot of ways. Um, but my, my question was kind of just what, what, you know, were some of your biggest sort of um, lessons or takeaways that you've kind of learned from, you know, what you lived through in this movement and then kind of going along with that, what are you sort of seeing as um, some of the greatest needs for the community at this time as we move into the future as well? Um, I, I don't know if that's too big of a question. But. Well, it's it's harder to say, um, you know, in a way, I'd almost like to put on a series, everything I learned in life, I learned from organizing. And you learn organizing by doing, and Wade Blank and his crew were very much instrumental. I didn't go back into organizing right away. I went through college and grad school and Peace Corps because I figured after I got Peace Corps on my damn resume, they're not going to ask me if I could do it. <laughs> I was so pissed at people always assuming that because I had crutches, I couldn't do a job. And it's like, I can write on the, on the blackboard, for God's sake. Do you think I'd go for a teaching degree if I couldn't? You know, uh, I never said it that way, but I felt it that way. And, and um, Wade basically taught me that when I felt that injustice, in my gut, that was an injustice. And it shouldn't happen. And it wasn't right. That was very, very important. Because when you're 15, it doesn't matter what you feel, you're a minor and your parents make the decisions for you. And when our parents said, I can't take care of you anymore, you have to go to a nursing home, there was no option. And Wade said they were right. There was no option, and it was still wrong. You know, he wasn't blaming them. He just said it was still wrong. You have the same rights as everybody else. And it took me a while to learn to stand up and to speak out with confidence that I would be taken seriously. I mean, I'd always been, I didn't do this deliberately, but I'd always been trying to be able-bodied because that was the only way I could survive as far as I knew. And actually about the time I reached age 30, my body collapsed because I was working, oh, 16 to 18 hours a day at different part-time jobs trying to make ends meet until I could get a really good full-time job, which just didn't happen. And that's how I ended up back with Wade and Atlantis and into this. I knew at that point that I was joining the civil rights movement and I was ready, you know? Um, going forward, employment is the final frontier. It, of course, is mandated under the ADA. Unfortunately, most of the cases that are brought 
are by people who become disabled on the job or like those two sisters who were nearsighted who wanted to be able to fly planes with glasses. You know, excuse me, I was born with a disability. I can do this job. And it's like vocational rehabilitation. They do very well, very well for a certain group of people. But most of us who have significant disabilities, eh, their track record is rather dismal. So it is employment and it means changing the terms for everybody. If you think about it, accommodation, who doesn't need accommodation at some point in their lives? You know, parents need accommodations for their kids. Single people should get accommodations for picking up everyone else's burdens. You know, accommodation, you just, every once in a while, you hit a glitch. And you need some accommodation so you can get over that hump and, and then come back and keep living your life. Life does not go in a straight line. So those are the biggest things. The stigma is really, really big. And I can tell you, when I was in Africa, there was no stigma to disability. And it was like opening a window. It was like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, it's like if you've ever seen a high school production of Camelot where somebody is putting their hands up to show where the fairy wall is, and it's like, it isn't there. <laughs> it isn't there. It was amazing. Now, people who became disabled in Africa had a miserable life. But um, I had no stigma. And in fact, my students made up stories because they couldn't imagine that someone who lived in America, where the streets are paved with gold, they couldn't have a disability. So they made up the story that I fell out of an airplane. <laughs> you realize these were prop planes that would fly from small town, one small town to another small town. But that's how that went. Anyone else? You are wiggling. <laughs> there. Um, Anyone else? What was, what was Wade's last name? Wade Blank. Uh, what was his name? Wade. Wade? Yeah, his last name? Blank. I had a friend, he would call up my friend at three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And George is going, uh, he says, completely blank here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, some of the other things that came out of this movement, um, well, Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. After Wade died and his core group took over, there was some friction between them because uh, there was kind of a, they tried to work as a team and it didn't work without somebody to smooth things over. That's how CCDC got started. And um, so there's a lot of similarity and we do join with ADAPT sometimes to do things. Um, the independent living movement also, all the independent living centers, that actually started with um, Ed Roberts in California in 1971. He was at Berkeley. They put him in the infirmary because they didn't know what else to do with him. He lived in an iron lung at night. And um, he and his group participated in most of the civil rights disobedience things. And then he decided it was his turn that they didn't want to live in the infirmary. They called themselves the Rolling Quads, and they um, wanted to live in their own rooms with attendants. They created a wheelchair repair shop on campus because they couldn't get the support they needed to keep their machines rolling. So they did a lot of things. And in 1971, I believe, or it was either 71 or 73, it may have been, 
that's when the Rehab Act happened. And Ed actually got to be, I think, the director of Vogue Rehab. And the whole creation of independent living centers started. And unfortunately, because they were tied to federal funding, they didn't feel empowered to do things like civil disobedience. Now, Boulder's different. It's always been on the front line. I hope it still is. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Some independent living centers are nicey-nicey and not doing what they should be doing. Others are really involved. When you get an independent living center providing too many services, then it has a conflict of interest because it's supposed to advocate. And you can't advocate against yourself. And then if you're the independent living center and people go to you for advocacy and then they get mad at their housing, what are they supposed to do? And that actually happened at Atlantis for a while. Um, that did change, but we did live long enough for our leadership to become as oppressive as able-bodied people. And that will happen in any movement. You have to really carefully watch that. It's, it's a cycle called the oppressed and the oppressed. And it's just, if you study um, civil disobedience and movements, you know that that's a pitfall you can fall into. And I always tell people, we're still human beings. We're absolutely as capable of being as asinine and as power driven as anyone else. You know, just because we've grown up disabled doesn't make us better than anybody. So you've got to be careful and watch for all those failings and, and stay true. And so I always ask myself, what's the issue? What's the issue? If there's a conflict, it's going to lay bare the issue. It's one of the principles I learned. Take a stand, even if it's wrong, because if it turns out to be wrong, you can always correct it. But if you don't take a stand and have people fall on either side of it, you won't know what the issue is. And uh, our president is very good at obfuscating the issue. So watch, watch that, because if you take a stand and you'll hear some of the reporters do it, you can get a glimpse of what the real issue is behind it. It's also pretty scary the first time you do it. <laughs> Probably have time for one more question if anybody wants to unmute. Oh my goodness. I, I dabbled know. all of that time. You did? What are that. we allowed to ask? <laughs> what are you allowed to ask? Yeah. Anything. Well, ask. She, doesn't mean she can answer it, but you can ask. <laughs> what would you like to know, Ruby? <laughs> oh, I, I actually am interested in what Richard uh, wrote to everyone what, about what are we doing to PTSD and gender alter, alternative participants? Okay. We have gender alternative participants within our membership. So, and we also have people with PTSD in our membership. Um, uh, housing is, I think I know who the city housing director, um, is or has been. Um, there are always things we have to keep working with. With PTSD, um, we have people who need different kinds of supports with that. Those are their accommodations. And I have worked specifically with people who have service animals and landlords still think they can kick them out. And I say, no, that's, that's, if it is, if your animal is trained to do something specific when you exhibit a specific symptom, it's a service animal and you cannot kick it out. And very often that's associated with someone who has PTSD and needs that that calming. Um, everybody sh shows it differently, but that is, it doesn't matter what the disability is, you wouldn't be asking for an accommodation if you didn't have one. What about related to uh, work, working, work accommodations with PTSD? With that, it's a, 
it usually means that you want to be doing something that is away from people. Mm. <laughs> and again, everybody's different. They have to let have some awareness of what their triggers are so that you don't put a person in a situation where they're going to be easily triggered. I had a, an autistic client very briefly. Um, the father was looking for something that his son could do. He trained as a librarian, but there had been a falling out with the public library. And so then I started looking at, okay, there are churches that have libraries. Um, where are some other places that have smaller libraries where he's not going to be around so many people? He ended up getting a, a job in an office at the state fair, I think. But that's what we would look at. Does this person need to be in a quiet place away from people and having a good connection with the supervisor? Okay. So it's kind of, it's different for everybody. But that, believe me, that is not the first time either. That's very common. Um, housing is really difficult because the, um, usually we're dealing with systems. Like um, if you lose your Medicaid, there are certain things that the state has to do. We can appeal that and there are certain ways that we build the proof, etc. In housing, it's not so clear. It may be um, that the Fair Housing Act does cover it, but what you're dealing with is public housing in that you have a Section 8 voucher or you're in government housing, but your landlord is an independent businessman. So it's kind of a mixture of public and private, and it is very, very difficult to get that um, hierarchy to respond. And I can give you an example where I had a woman who worked with the Independent Living Center here when the director was, I would say, somewhat misogynist. And um, it was tripping her out. And uh, she was renting an apartment that he owned. The sewer overflowed onto her carpet and he, and he was blaming it on her companion dog. Mm. And she had purchased a refurbished computer from him that she had not paid him for. And of course she was an employee. So you can see that when an independent living center offers services like that, you can put yourself in a real bind. And in advocating for her, what I found out from the regional office was landlords have all kinds of relationships with their tenants on the side. We're not interested in those at all. The only thing he has to do is let his board know that he is housing employees and tenants. He, as long as he doesn't have anything to do with their um, Section 8 itself, with their eligibility, as long as he doesn't have anything to do with their eligibility, he's okay. And every bone in my body is saying, no, this is not okay. It's a conflict of interest. And I, I still believe that in terms of defining what a conflict of interest is, it is but it isn't legally defined that way. So housing is really difficult. Um, and I'm not sure how to go about um, confronting someone in that chain of command who is very definitely racist, but you'll have to put together a concerted effort. And what they do is test it. You send in a person that meets this exact profile and they get the apartment or they get the services. You send in someone else with that exact profile, except they're a different race or whatever the problem is. 
and they don't get it and you know it's available, then you've got proof that that's pretty much what you've got to do. It's got to be very carefully mapped out over a period of time. And I think there are a couple of agencies in Denver that might be able to help with that. Denver, um, Kristen, um, I, I do have to, two things. One, we do have to wrap up, but I wanted to say the Denver Metro Fair Housing actually hires people to go. Yeah, in, that, uh, as that's secret. That's housing. what I was going to recommend. Denver mm -hmm. Fair Housing. Yeah, you know, if that's, a, if that's a problem for you, um, I would put the word out, um, try to get a group together, people who either want to help you or who are having the same problem, and put together a strategy with them and follow through on it. Um, whatever it, you do, you're stronger in numbers. I think we have to call it good, Kristen. Okay. Good information. Was it good? <laughs> what we might have to do is do it again or continue the conversation from here. We'll talk a little bit more about it. How's that sound? Yeah, well, it could lead into organizing, and I don't know who's teaching that. <laughs> Dawn is doing some of it, but that doesn't mean there isn't room for more. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, I've often thought I should codify the <laughs> life according to Wade Blank, you know, because yeah. it really is, it really, these are life skills. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, Kristen, thank you especially for sharing your uh, history and your experience and your wisdom.